food is such a big lever that we can use to drive change, which is which is where I guess my optimism comes in because everybody eats and we if we eat three times a day, that's a thousand meals over a year. And that's an opportunity each time we eat to, you know, put our dollars where our values are, but also to be able to raise our consciousness about doing that. <laughs> Karen Natoli is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Sharon is a communication expert who is passionate about creating a better future by helping individuals, organizations, and leaders speak up and be heard. She helps her clients own their voice, gain clarity around messages that matter, and build personal, collective, and organizational power. By sharing their thoughts, opinions, and ideas effectively and consistently with the world. Sharon believes when individuals are fully self-expressed, teams are connected, and organizations have an authentic voice about the future. Business thrives, innovation accelerates, cultures flourish, and relationships strengthen. She has 30 years experience in communication, message development, speaking, and presenting, and has deep understanding of the power of the spoken and written word. Sharon has participated in hundreds of media interviews and, sp and been a spokesperson, uh, filled spokesperson roles, regularly speaks at conferences and events, and has been a columnist, editor, and contributor to magazine, newspapers, and television programs. Sharon has extensive experience as an advisor to local and global food businesses on meaningful messages, development to enable future readiness and attract market attention. She is the author and co-author of four books and her background in food, nutrition and counseling provides her with an in-depth understanding of the nuances of human behavior. This is the book that we will be discussing today, among many other things, with Sharon, Food for a Better Future is the book and wonderful gift from Sharon that she wrote wonderful things in, in the beginning uh, of the book for me and, and gave me a real nice personal note. Also, she is a contributor to my book, which is a compilation of 34 plus uh, other contributors called Menu B, and uh, she speaks very wonderfully uh, with all her understanding and knowledge in this industry to really engage with those readers and that. I really want to thank Sharon for being on the show and welcome you to, to be here today. Thank you, Mark. It's great to meet you online after uh, including your name in my book, you inspired me with a with a quote actually, and I was I was uh, really taken with that, which was you mentioned something like our food, our products are not our products in relation to a company that you were involved with in at the time, um, but it's how we produce them, and I think how is such a such an important part of the whole food you know, food and how we talk about food now. It's not just what, but how and why. That's absolutely so true. And uh, it's really something that I say quite a bit. And we mention it in the new book and I mention it pretty much um, every other podcast and in, in my speeches and discussions that I have around the world. It's really not the brands of the future or the products of the future or um, the food tribes of the future, whether it's vegan, flexitarian, paleo, keto, on and on. Uh, and there's many more emerging every day uh, that will solve human suffering, the human health problems and our global grand challenges. And so I really kind of the mantra just to surmise the quote for those who might not have heard it before that is in your book so nicely uh, put in there is it, it's really about how we produce 
that has the biggest impact to solve our global grand challenges and human suffering and human health. If we don't produce with pesticides, aromas, flavors, preservatives, high processing, things that are mineral and vitamin nutritionally empty to begin with, and we don't produce packaging waste and, and environmental greenhouse gases in the process of that production, then it's very difficult. It's extremely hard to make one bad products that are bad for health or bad for our environment. And it's just a better model to solving a lot of the problems that we have in our world. And um, one thing that usually falls under the radar with that is um, in that process of how we produce, it's looking very strongly at the natural capital and the true cost that it costs to produce those fo foods, which in our world has kind of gone under the rug or have been swept under the rug, that we don't pay the true cost or the natural capital of those resources and water and transportation and many other things that go into the production of those pro uh, products. So I really appreciate the, 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 the nice addition of the quote in there. You've been doing this for such a long time, and I'm so glad that we were finally able to find a time to speak on the podcast. I'm overwhelmed with your contr contribution so eloquently in the book. Um, having said that, you've been talking and discussing all these topics for such a long time, and then 2020, boom, we were hit with some of the craziest times our world has ever faced. Very, very hard times. Um, not just the pandemic and, and, and mutations of the pandemic, but Brexit and, and uh, the EU issues and Black Lives Matters and Asian racism and uh, the inauguration of the United States, the craziness that rippled throughout the world um, that, that were really kind of saying, these are the craziest times ever. And I wanna know a couple things. How have you weathered this crazy time? But all those years that you've been speaking about that there's better ways, better ways to communicate, better ways to operate, has that helped you to weather this time any better? And how have you been? And, and did, did it pro prove to be a more resilient or better model for life that kind of say, yeah, well, I, I made it through okay, but um, here's some better models, ways to live. Or I also had some learning lessons from my clients and things that I did that, that bubbled to the surface that, that have shown us. So if you could address that, I'd really appreciate it. I want to know how you've been during this time. Yes, look, luckily in Australia, we've been, I think, pretty lucky with the way that things have been handled here. In terms of COVID, we have had our outbreaks and uh, things, but nowhere near as bad as certainly other areas in the world. So I'm grateful that I do live in Sydney and in Australia. So we've, I, I think that, um, so we've, I guess, weathered it fairly, fairly well. The, the biggest, the, you know, from a, from a food industry perspective, obviously there was big changes and challenges with the distribution of food. And of course, in Australia, we have larger distances through which to, you know, food needs to, to travel from place to place across, um, you know, between states and so on. But one of the good things I think out of this time is really getting accustomed to this way of communicating online to that, that it's brought us closer together in many ways. And I'm a big fan of in-person connection and I think we can't replace that, you know, completely. And that, you know, recently we I, I got together with some people who I've been had only just met online you know, over the course of the last 12 months, it was so nice to actually connect with them in person. And you do get those different, you know, um, the, the, the ability to, to really, you know, the, the touch and the feel and that sort of thing. But what I was able to, well, what I did last year and, and was really good in terms of bringing people together was started an initiative called the Virtual Lunchroom, where I interviewed people from across the food sector to hear their stories of change and hear what they were doing during that time. 
And so we got together over a virtual lunch uh, and we um, provided a platform for them to share what was happening for them. And that was really to create that connection, um, but also to, to provide a platform too for inspiration because inspiring change is I think really the way to go when it comes to the future. You know, when it, when it comes to behavior change, we can try and coerce people or we can try and motivate or we can inspire. And I think inspiration is the, the way to go. So hearing, you know, hearing other, other people's stories and what you do in terms of providing a platform for discussions and conversations is really important. And so I think, you know, one of, certainly one of the benefits from this last, um, you know, to 18 months now, isn't it nearly, or more over a year, uh, is that we've got used to this way of communicating. And so it feels quite comfortable now to be talking with you. Uh, you're in Germany, I'm in Sydney. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think that's a benefit. It's, we're more accessible, uh, I, I feel, through online communication and getting used to this, you know, video um, uh, conversation. I, I really appreciate you giving us that um, very upbeat um, message of what you've experienced. And you're a very positive person. You're big on bringing people together, making connections and having these positive communications. But I'm going to hack a little bit deeper. I'm going to I want to go a little bit deeper and see how how you're having this positive uh, experience and, and uh, staying so upbeat and positive and, and to tell us a little bit more. The reason the reason I am so Australia and even New Zealand have a very unique culture, a very unique culture around food. Um, uh, views of their life and some some are sex super positive super progressive when it comes to pandemics and rallying as as nations and doing the right positive things uh, but in some other respects uh, a, a, a big struggle before the pandemic hit you guys from November December of 2019 clear into maybe February or, or even March uh, uh, or February, uh, April, um, March, maybe even to April, you guys experience severe brush fires. I actually so so extreme brush fires. It's it's unbelievable. And you're kind of close to New South Wales, and, and uh, really kind of the this the epicenter in some respects of of seeing some of those um, issues bubble up. Uh, just for for the listeners and, and to put that into perspective because those brush fires since the pandemic started were almost brushed under the rug before um before the pandemic we were seeing selfies and photos of uh, koala bears and kangaroos and, and kind of in the midst of these flames and uh, i had john uh, pickrell on the show who wrote the book flames of extinction and talked about this extensively but the this brush fire was actually worse than an atomic bomb going off for the emissions and for the amount of uh, impact that it had um, a year in australia alone your emissions for an entire year are are really somewhere around 600 uh, million uh, tons of, of emissions a year. Uh, just during that period from really from December to, to March or even February of those brush fires, you admitted more than your yearly, entire yearly carbon emissions for a country, which is that in, in and of itself is, is unbelievable that I don't think humanity can fathom uh, uh, how big that is. Um, 530 million tons uh, uh, annually, I think is the normal, but it was between 650 million and, and more accurate statements now are coming as we're getting more data to 1.2 billion tons of CO2 that was emitted at that time. 19 million, 19 million hectares were lost in the fires. Um, 
one lightning strike in the Blue Mountains, um, which is a World Heritage Site, burned 85,000 hectares in one month. Three billion wild animal species were lost. Seven billion tree uh, trees were lost. Oh, those are huge numbers, and and I don't want to be doom and gloom, but that to to get into the reality about it, and you're the expert there on communication. That that is that's an impact that, that you just don't recover from, and you're not hearing about that extreme biosphere biodiversity loss and and the impact of that. So I just kind of want to say, uh, uh, kind of get your your views on that and how, how you've recovered it, but also um, through all that loss, what's happening? W what are you doing? Is that okay? Is that something that we can get back into to range or how, how do you deal with all that? Yeah, so look, it was devastating, the, the bushfires. It's, uh, you know, and, and it was... Um, uh, very, you know, I mean, I'm in Sydney and, and we, we're in it, so we're in a city, but, you know, we, we have the, the, the smoke and, you know, the effect of the bushfire, even in a big, even in, you know, the cities and of course all the devastation in terms of, as you mentioned, the wildlife and uh, the land and the biodiversity impacts and so on. So I, I think, yeah, definitely Australia has a long way to go. We're very much behind in many ways when it comes to climate change, action, policy, um, those sort of things. And, and from a dietary perspective as well, we don't, we have the, the highest out of the G20, we have the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions from our diet. You're, uh, you're, you're right in terms of, um, the being in a country like Australia, there is a lot of work to be done, and and that's why I, I think one of the things about food. So my my area of expertise is in the food sector. Is that we have you know food is such a big lever that we can use to drive change, which is which is where I guess my optimism comes in because everybody eats. And we, if we eat three times a day, that's a thousand meals over a year. And that's an opportunity each time we eat to, you know, put our dollars where our values are, but also to be able to raise our consciousness about doing that. And, and I guess also to link that to things like the bushfires and the state of our climate and to put the power into the hands of individuals to, to make a difference. Uh, and one of the big things I think that we need to um, work on or drive, drive a change of thinking in is that we feel as though we don't make a difference. And so when we talk about big numbers or big impacts and climate change and um, sustainability, you know, these big uh, things that we talk about can feel so big that we can think, oh, well, they're so big and so, um, uh, you know, we're so far down the track. Uh, can we actually make a difference? And and feeling as though, and so we've, we've, we've got to be able to, I guess, walk a line between, yes, you know, we've got these big problems and we need to be realistic and aware that, yes, uh, and in Australia, you know, that we're we're actually quite a way behind where other countries are in many respects, and our diets, um, you know, not sustainable. So, but but how how do we bring that down to then? Okay, as an individual, I can make a difference uh, and overcome that sense of indifference that I think drives us, you know, traps us in a sense of apathy. Uh, so that's where I think inspiration can come in is because being able to uh, address indifference is, is, well, we can say, you make a difference, you know, Mark, yes, you, you are important and you make a difference. And we can go, okay, but was that really going to drive change? 
um, or is that going to change our mindset? Or, or you know, we can connect people around a common purpose and create that collaboration and and that feeling and sense that we're working together towards something. So, talking about and connecting with people's values, can, creating connection around a common purpose, inspiring people, is I think how we can address that sense of indifference. I, I really like that and that perspective. If you don't mind, I want to go just a tad bit deeper. Um, so uh, the, uh, the way I see it is really because most humans eat three times a day, it's really one of the biggest ways we can draw down some of the effects or have an influence on something that can seem big and overwhelming. But just in, in the way we eat, we do it three times a day over a thousand meals a year. and um, uh, it, it's a way that we can really have an impact on that and, and connect by not just connecting ourselves to food, but also understanding a little bit where that source comes from. So I always say that the basic energy source for human beings is food. It's a breathing food and water, um, but, but really it, it, it is food. It's um, what the, the measurement, it's a, a, a caloric intake or a calorie is an, a, a measurement of energy. So I don't want you to count your calories, but I want you to understand it's a measurement of energy that regulates our body temperature and keeps, so to say, our motor running, keeps us, uh, our, our body temperature regulated, gives us the energy to work and, and, and do the things that we need to do. And um, to put that energy source in the hands or the reliance of someone else to me, it would seem like a huge risk factor, a, a, a place where I'm vulnerable. I would never buy a car and not know where I'm going to get the gasoline from, or even an electric car and not know how I'm going to charge the battery on limited mileages to drive that car, or a cell phone that, that I couldn't know how I'm going to charge it up so that I can use it. Um, but to go more personal, I would never want to put that full responsibility on someone else on how and where I get the, the right energy to keep my motor running. And so I think it's not only the biggest way to draw it down, but it's the biggest way to reconnect ourselves to that energy source, which gives us uh, a lot of resilience, a lot of, it's a better operating system. It gives us a lot of empowerment to not feel overwhelmed on such a big, on such a big thing. And, and um, during the, I don't know how it was in Australia, but in the United States and in Europe, just a few days into the pandemic, shells of long lasting uh, non-perishable items on the grocery store shelves were totally empty. People were buying water and mass droves and uh, uh, toilet paper, like uh, unbelievable, you know? And, um, you know, so there are some big questions around that. And so I, I wanna go even a little bit deeper is what are your thoughts on that, the culture and seeing that connection? And do you think that's bubbling to the surface? Is there more awareness? And what, what are you seeing that that awareness is, gaining momentum now that we've gone through the pandemic people say boy i don't want to be in that situation ever again and i want to kind of take more control i'd, I'd like to get more feedback on your views mm, yeah yes in australia we did have the same thing the shelves were emptied of pasta and flour and sugar and toilet paper so oh, we did see that and one of the people that i interviewed last year was from uh, a company that does um food cubes, which is a grown system, you know, where you can grow your own food in a cube and it has a water saving uh, uh, aspect to it and a self watering aspect to it. So it's quite easy. And two weeks into the pandemic, his sales were more than tripled because people were concerned about food security. And so, you know, you can grow, you can grow uh, the equivalent of uh, three adults, the fruit, the, the vegetables for three adults over the course of a year in these food cubes in a, a space the size of two car parks. Um, and so, uh, yeah, their, their sales really 
really increased because people were concerned about food security. And so one way, of course, to address that is to grow your own food. Um, and another person, <coughs> excuse me, who I talked to last year from Sustain Australia also found that that <coughs> inter increased interest in home gardening and that people had found over the pandemic last year, not only that reconnect, you know, no, the food security side of growing your own food at home, but also that as an outlet for stress management, um, you know, in times of uncertainty, it's, it's people, it gives, gives you a focus, reconnecting to nature and, um, and also connecting with others in community gardens and things like that. So there was the, yes, definite evidence of increased interest in growing food at home to address food security and also much more interest in local food, so Australian grown and made uh, and, and food that provided some immune benefits as well. So I think a lot of companies ended up jumping on that as a bit of a marketing thing, but uh, you know, how, well, how can I eat to, pr to protect my immune system? So there was, yes, change driven around more local and um, food production and so you know where it comes from and how it's how it's grown uh, or more I guess more so where it's grown um, but also from uh, as people have more time at home and did more cooking themselves that interest in food was you know become higher which is a good which is a really positive thing too out of out of last year and this year. So I love the fact that you're also wearing your sustainable development goal pin. And uh, you know that I'm an advocate for the SDGs and have been since 2015. And that that really is um, the world's first ever global moonshot, the sustainable development goals. And it's a date, um, September 25th, 2015. That is a historical date in humanity's history. It's the first time ever that 197 countries came together, which is unheard of, unprecedented, and agreed not only on the sustainable development goals, but then later in December, um, agreed on the Paris Agreement to keep our planet at 1.5 degrees of warming. A lot of people don't understand, oh, who are the sustainable development goals for? Are they for countries and cities or corporations? And they're really uh very misunderstood and they, they were presented to us very linear and lateral uh from one to 17 kind of a siloed approach of pre presenting them but they are a system they're all tied together and the unique thing is for our our area of focus is all 17 are tied to agriculture seafood food and beverage industries they're all tied to food and they're tied together as a system. It's virtually impossible to work on one sustainable development goal and not touch on the others because they're a system. And so when companies or cities or countries say, oh, we're working on this one and this one, there's no cherry picking them because you automatically touch on them all. And they're the basic protection plan or the big plan for humanity and for our basic resources and our needs. And I really love that that you've also embraced that and talk about it and in your contribution and in, in the book you you really go into detail about the SDGs and how not only everybody has a seat at the table but how we can apply them into our lives and how we should look at them and I just loved uh, what you had to say about it that that uh, we shouldn't underestimate our ability. I just want to reiterate one more time it's the world's first ever global moonshot. It's a historical precedence. If you know anything about politics or delegates or politicians, it's hard enough for two countries to come together and decide where they're going to eat lunch, let alone 197 on a plan, a roadmap of action to get us to a better December 2030, a better future. And, um, and and it's I, I I look at it just like I said a caloric uh, unit a calorie is a measurement of energy. I look at the sustainable development goals as an insurance plan for humanity 
and our earth to get us to a better future and also as a very set roadmap on how how to get there um i've spoken to and, and have other people from uh australia and new zealand in the book uh, nika moldsworth she um basically is a farmer she's in a very uh uh, arid area where she's doing farming she's doing sheep and and other uh, animal uh, agriculture uh, in a very rough rough area to to do that and then there's Paul Noonham who is the head or CEO of SDG2 advocacy which is number two SDG is zero uh, zero hunger basically addressing hunger and how we address that around the world and many others, where I'm getting to is I really think that not only to realize that there's a plan for the future, but in each specific area of the world where we live, we need to make kind of an assessment of how the infrastructure and the basic needs are being met. And that's done through what you do, communication, a form of advocacy, helping organizations and people understand What's the situation we're in? How do we communicate that in a very positive way? And what are the actions and the tools uh, moving forward? And so I, I really want to know, maybe even if you could, I, I don't want you to be too negative, but I would like you to say, what are the challenges that you face in your region with Australians? Is it because they're big meat eaters? Is it because they're looking for the government to solve the solution or what are some things that you've seen and what are the tools that you provide them to help them kind of do and talk about it differently but also maybe even not just food in other ways to talk about any topic at a world stage or at an organizational level that really can help them get onto a better track a better operating manual uh, for their organization or their life yeah it's a good Good um, discussion. We we uh, you know having back when we could travel and I was in Europe and Italy in 2019. And the sustainable development goals are very much more part of the conversation in Europe compared to Australia. And we we have very I guess we we didn't have any um, I guess research or data or anything looking at how well they've been adopted by food businesses in Australia. And I know that, so, so from a business perspective, they're, they're more aware or, or startups and, and uh, you know, accelerator programs are well aware of the sustainable development goals, but they're, they're not as mainstream in Australia. And at Food and Nutrition Australia, which is my business, we decided to do a little bit of research into this last year as a bit of a project. And we looked at the top 100 Australia um, food and drink companies in Australia. And were they, were they reporting against the sustainable development goals? Were they talking about them from a communication perspective? Because I think there's no, there's no doubt that they are like exactly what you said, like that, um, they're a global agreement about this is the way to go. So if you want to create a better future, well, you don't have to make up the targets. They're already there. So that's a, I think that's a big benefit. You just go, yep, that's the way we're going. Uh, and then it's like, how are we going to get there? And are we committed to it? And we looked at, uh, you know, we looked at publicly available information on, on the websites of the top 100 companies. So it's just a little bit of a, an overview, I guess, or a little bit of a, a dipstick into looking at how well the, the sustainable development goals were being taken up. And we found that 83% of the top 100 companies operating in Australia, the food and drink companies, mentioned sustainability somewhere on their website. So that indicates the majority uh, have, have that on their mind in to some extent, I guess. Um, and 61% took extra initiatives by having, like they had a, a specific section around sustainability on their website. But um, many cases that was, you know, packaging was the main thing that they looked at. And only 18% actually mentioned the sustainable development goals. 
And that doesn't mean that some of them uh, don't have them somewhere within their business as part of what they do or, 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 you know, in their reporting, internal reporting perhaps. But it's a very, you know, it's a small number. It's it's 18% of the top 100 aren't, don't have the sustainable development goals top of mind enough to put them on, you know, to put some sort of mention of them on their web website um, as a starting point. And so there's a lot of agreement that this is important, but, you know, it's, there. there's much more, there's, there's two things, I guess there's, well, let's take, let's do more and take action because that's the, the right thing to do. We've agreed on that as a, as a country. Um, but, but it also makes sense to me from a communication perspective because the biggest currency for a business is trust and the way to generate trust is to connect to the things that people value. And we know, and we mentioned the bushfires and the climate change and that sort of thing. It's much, much more top of mind and it was very much, very much top of mind leading up to our last federal election uh, so from a political perspective, you know, from a business perspective, it makes sense to be talking about the things that people care about and climate, the climate is one of them, sustainable development goals are the way to go. And it's very, very easy, as you said, also to connect all of the sustainable development goals to food. And, and as you said, too, you can't, you know, just pick one and not be off, not be actually addressing some of the others. So I think... Uh, I think there's an opportunity for companies to to make a difference, but also for that to be good for business. And that's that you know idea of being purposeful and viable. Uh, you know they go together these days. You can't. I don't think you can really have a, a business that's going to survive in the long term without it having a purpose and and doing the next right thing as well. That's beautiful. And, and, you know, that's so true. And really, uh, I'm glad that we're hopefully emerging out of this pandemic and lockdown and the craziness and, and maybe on the horizon, there, there may be other things. And we know from climate change and that, that, that there will be other things that come. But I, I want to refer back to, you know, at the beginning and clear till to this point, there's been economic, extreme economic downturn and hardships, uh, crisis. Um, there's been a, a lot around food insecurity and a lot of around, um, around health that emerged. But the real concern for organizations that have had to lay off and close down, maybe might not uh, uh, open back up and it's really food is an essential service that normally has been given the stamp to remain open during this time. And when we saw during this period that those food organizations that were essential services and were allowed to remain open, that some of them thrived and flourished extremely well and others who had the wrong model or the wrong structure really were affected not only with more COVID uh, cases, but also worse working conditions. Uh, in, in Germany, a big meat company called Tunis was, had extreme problems, extreme cases and uh, shut down and the shelves were empty for meats, but also because of contamination, many other things in the United States, the meat sector was a big issue. I don't know how it was. And Australia or New Zealand, um, you could you could tell us that. But where I'm going to to is really sustainability has had a transition or a journey over the last uh, um, century, really, um, and, and it's really started out as health, safety, and environment, or health and safety executives. Then it went into um, compliance, then it went into corporate social responsibility, CSR, and now it, it's really went to environmental social governance. And, and maybe even before environmental social governance, there's been a lot of talk since 2015 around the SDGs and applying those into your, your business. 
What we saw in 2020, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter of uh, investing, those um, organizations that had applied the SDGs and environmental social governance into their business models, all weathered this pandemic and this economic downturn better than their conventional counterparts. So in the first or second quarter of 2020, a lot of people say, oh, it's just a fluke. It's Maybe it's not real. It's going to end. And that curve just continued, climbed and climbed and climbed to the end of the fourth quarter of 2020. So the Nikkei index, the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, the S&P Global, in the first quarter of 2020, uh, 20, the Morning Star Review said that 25 out of 28 of, uh, 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 of sustainable index funds outperformed their conventional counterparts, 25 out of 28. That was in the first quarter. By the time we got to the fourth quarter, it was 27 out of 28 had outperformed their conventional counterparts. And the, the index funds, the ESG performance, was on a hockey stick curve and it has not stopped. This year, we're, we're into uh, half of the year already. And the first two quarters, same thing, outperforming. It's proven to not only be profitable, it's proven to be a better secure, resilient model. It's a better operating system and model for your business. So it's not like before the big talk was boy, sustainability is expensive, it's hard, we don't understand, it. it's hard to implement. Now that's been blown out of the water because those who had implemented it before and even got on the bandwagon during 2020 and, and made changes that needed to be made in the organization, they're all like, why didn't we do this years before? And you kind of touched upon this in your discussion as well that, um, yeah, that organizations are kind of almost faking it. You said the SDGs, or some have it on their website, and we we call that greenwashing. But it's but it's this principle to kind of fake it until you make it, that which is a very positive thing. So I I I encourage any organization to try to fake it until they make it, and even if it's half-hearted, because the results we've seen over time is that. Um, their customers, their employees, their contractors, and in their organization will all say, even, even if they don't know they're greenwashing, they'll say, wow, wow, this is really seeing positive results and people are happy and they like that we're talking about this and they like that we're moving in that, that most organizations within less than a year have usually come back and said, wow, we only kind of half-heartedly did this because we thought that's where the trend is. But look what it's showing us that better results, better communication, people are buying even more. They, they love it. And then they make that shift 100%. And they're like, oh, oh my goodness, this is, this is a better operating system. This is a better model, not only for profit, but also for human health and the environment. And I don't know how you've seen that as well, but it's just it, time over time, it's been proven. I wanted to see if what you've seen in that respect. Yeah, yeah, I love what you've just said. Um, I think that we do need to look, like business from a business perspective, look more broad, more broadly at all of the good things that making a commitment to, to sustainability does, because there's there is the, the the climate part and the actual, I guess, you know, the practicalities of it and what we need to do from a, a global you know responsible being a responsible business but bringing that inside then it does create that um, it does help to retain um, staff to to create a better culture uh, because we know that more people are looking for to work for companies that are more meaningful so if you can talk about how you're committed to the sustainable development goals you have those initiatives in place uh, then that that makes you know it makes so much sense for a food company uh, in particular to to use that as the you know the meaningful part of what they do. So that creates that con connected culture 
um, and 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 therefore people feel better about coming to work. Um, you they feel more inspired. They're going to do a better job. You're going to move faster. You know, and then that all that all sort of links together up the chain, and then hopefully we do move faster towards the 2030 target. Um, so, so yes, I think thinking more broadly, and and certainly the we've seen in Australia, I think it's um, you know investment in uh, re like responsible investing has tripled since 2013. So, you know, when money goes in a particular direction, of course, that helps to, to, to create movement as well from a business perspective. And the other thing I, the other thing actually I liked about what you just said is the idea that, you know, that sort of fake it till you make it. Well, you know, yes and no, I guess. But, 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 but um, the key thing out of that, I think, is the idea of, you know, talk about creating currency in better. Like, like how can we... Yes, yes, let's just get better and, and create, um, uh, you know, currency in that, like, like let's reward that, let's, let's in, encourage that and not expect that we've got to be perfect uh, before we talk about what we're doing or, you know, go out and say we're, we're making change because we can get stopped also from trying to do things, you know, get, get to 100%, have no, nowhere where people can criticise us but today people are really interested like like transparency in what we're doing is talking about well we aren't perfect you know we know that we've still got this to do but we're trying our best and this is what we are doing and and so i think a lot of a lot of the time from you know from a business perspective we can i can see see that uh you know Leaders and people in the industry are a bit reluctant to talk about some of the things they're doing because they they might be doing this, but they're not doing this over here, and so they're afraid that they're going to get criticised for this bit over here. Uh, when actually, if you're honest and transparent and authentic, that actually um, people appreciate that. So yes, uh, but I, I love what you said about fake it till you make it, and then they go, oh yeah, oh uh, absolutely, <laughs> oh. <Keep going. laughs> Oh, open and transparency is very vital. Um, and I'm, I'm going to let everyone in on a secret. So those organizations that are greenwashing or trying to fake it, um, not fake it till they make it, they don't know that yet. They're just faking it. They're kind of uh, following what they think is a trend and uh, sustainability and kind of giving an outward presence of that. Um, those who do it are, are quickly, uh, the, the curtains are lifted and the, the, whether they're truly faking it comes out very quick because of open and transparency and because consumers are, are smart and, and uh, other companies and organizations are very smart um, at, at seeing whether that's true or not, whether a project that they're doing that has a start and end date is just a project to appease humanity or if it's something that transitions and transforms the world for better. And when you follow up with them in a year, no, humanity hasn't forgotten what you said back then. Are you going to continue that process? Are you going to continue? So it's actually, in some respects, kind of a trick because once they get into that, it's hard to go back unless you take a strong stance that you don't believe in climate and food and in the environment and, and those things. And so it's just an automatic path to go in the right direction. I want to uh, discuss uh, be, be just a tad bit more bef and then I'll stop harping on on uh, uh, New Zealand and Australia as far as focus in on, on what's happening in that neck of the world. But it's, there's really so much positive and so many wonderful things there uh, as an example to the rest of the world that I wanna bring up, but also as a form of uh, awareness. So um, to have that awareness and that knowledge of the true assessment of what's going on, where you live and where you belong is so important because it keeps you from being ignorant about what's happening for the future. You don't, you won't arrive in the future and say, how did we not know this? Or how did we not act or handle in the right way? And uh, specifically uh, towards, towards that end is really, 
Um, this year, it was just run, announced, uh, uh, I believe, two weeks ago, that Earth Overshoot Day will fall on July 29th this year. Earth Overshoot Day is calculated based on a global hectare. Um, 1.6 global hectares are replicable, meaning that's replicable, meaning if, if we each, every human being on Earth had 1.6 global hectares, they would have enough security, shelter, food, water, and uh, to, to live a long and abundant life, you know, 80, 90, 100 years of age, if they had good stewardship over that global hectare. So Earth Overshoot Day in 2020 was August 22nd. Um, and because of the pandemic and, and certain things, we, we gained, I think, 24, 25 days. Um, but now we actually have seen that we've actually on resources, on emissions and many other things, we're back uh, to July 29th as the day we've gone beyond our finite resources because per person on this earth, we're using 2.98 global hectares per person on a global average, which is a resource overshoot or a deficit. The reason I bring that up is for a couple. Um, Germany reached Germany's overshoot day um, on Cinco de Mayo, May 5th. My, it's one of my favorite days. I love Mexican food. I love to eat it. And it, for me, it's a fiesta. It's a day of celebration. I, I'm, I, I go into a food frenzy and I love to, I just love Mexican food. And I loved that day. Um, and, uh, one of my good friend's birthday is on, is on that day as well. But I just love the food. Well, on that day, the 5th of May, Germany had gone over their finite resources four months into the year and five days. Unbelievable, not even half of the year. And I'm like, how, how can that be? And you might have heard this before that if we all lived like Germans, we would need three and a half planets worth of resources. If we all lived like Americans, we, we would need like five and a half uh, planets worth of resources. Um, the reason I bring it up is Australia is so great place because it's such a big space and you have so much land. You're the only country in the entire world living within the planetary boundaries and living within your global hectare. As a country, I believe you're the closest. I think you might even be in December on your Earth overshoot because of those hectares that you have and those resources, which is, in some respects, it means that that feedback loop of seeing what the problems are are not as present because there's more space, even though we're all on the spaceship Earth, because of that, um, Australia is in a pretty good, and probably doing the best, just from sheer uh, population and land size, that hectare, uh, which is nice. But on the flip side, and this is ties to food a lot, um, there's a, an assessment that we do on city levels, community levels, state levels, and country levels, of what, how many workers for food are there? How much is produced by farms and production and manufacturing facilities? And then how much is exported and how much is imported? And um, for Australia, it's really where high animal agriculture, uh, sheep, pigs, uh, cattle, uh, which is, uh, as, we, as we know, we don't need to go into very heavy on environmental impacts and also human health impacts. As a dietitian nutritionist, you really know the ins and outs on that. And we, we can discuss that as well. Um, but as we, we look at how much of those meat products or those animal products are shipped outside of Australia, um, I think the last study I looked at it and it was, it was in 2019 was saying that close to 90%, if not even more, of all the animal agriculture that was produced in Australia was being first shipped to China and then other places in the world. Um, that's quite a su substantial amount. But then also the same amount was being, there was not a same, but a very substantial amount was being shipped back in. And then other products that you do, how many you ship out, and then that same amount is being shipped back in. And so it's like, 
doesn't make sense. Why are we shipping this out and then shipping the same amount in? And there's this assessment imbalance in what's going on. But more so than that imbalance, um, I, 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 kind of, I kind of give an analogy. If, if my home was Australia, and I, I says, I'm going to go to Germany uh, and on vacation, and I want, want you to come in and, and, and live in my home for a year. Um, and, and he says, oh, great, no problem. I'm going to don't charge anything. You don't pay anything. And the whole time you're here, you never took out the garbage. You never washed the dishes. You never did the laundry. And you just left all that mess. And when I came back after a year, boy, my house was full of garbage. It stank, fruit flies, and everything's everywhere. And uh, things were mildew and rotten. The dishes were all piled up. Um, that, that waste and that uh, was all left for me. To handle and then you get to go back to your home where you were at and say oh great in australia when you produce animal agriculture there's the water resources there's the environmental impact of, of uh, soil degradation and methane emissions and and other emissions um, from those animals and uh, the real natural cost the true capital of that cost of, the, of producing those animals, uh, the, all the environmental impact remains in Australia. And those that you're shipping that product to never get to, they're, they're like, oh, I'm so glad that Australia kept all basically, and I hate to say it, kept the shit in Australia because you're allowing others to shit on you. And here's the caveat those products aren't being sold for true cost and true value. They're being sold pretty cheap. There's no environmental cost impacts, true cost impacts being recouped in the sale of those products for all the environmental damage and human health damage on your air pollution that's incurred from that animal production in Australia. And that's an imbalance. That's a thing that just can't go on forever. And I'm wondering, why and it's not just australia the same thing is happening in brazil with the burning down of the rainforest to have farms and produce more cattle and agriculture and, and so I, I really want to see is that truly in the minds of everyone in australia whether they're tied to the agriculture uh, place or not that those environmental and human health impacts of producing those animals isn't a long-term being accounted for for those externalities, which could have produced more brush fires or made the brush fires more intense or desertification more intense um, because of the way you're treating your land. Mm. Yes. Um, so yeah, in Australia, we have a, I guess, traditionally it's a high meat intake. Uh, meat consumption is dropping because we know particularly younger people now are interested in much more of a plant-based diet so the the demand there's a there's a shift in demand uh, i know that the industry because we did have a future of meat session in our virtual lunchroom last year where we spoke to someone from the, the sustainability manager from meat and livestock australia and they are they are looking at uh, you know, what can things like putting seaweed in the feed of the cattle, which reduces the methane production of the, the animals, and other initiatives on farm to look at how they can improve the production side of, of meat. So, th so there are there are changes, and I guess that's what we can that's that's what we can hope for at this point. Is yes, there is change that things don't aren't just staying the same. Uh, so, from a production perspective, and then also from a local demand perspective, there are changes. Uh, but I know that in that you know that eat report that I mentioned earlier the last year that our Australia topped the the list for greenhouse gas emissions per capita for our diet um, because meat is such a such a, a big part of it so yes there's change to be made and uh, and it and it's happening I guess the question is how fast and I can't answer that specifically but but uh, but there is change yes 
yes, and uh, and we need to continue to to work on that. What what do you see the culture? Is there pushback from from the culture of of uh, just creating a different food system? And I just want to caveat: by no means do I say we all need to go vegan or stop eating meat. I, I believe that there's some very good regenerative. Uh, practices um, uh, on grass fed and, and grazing animals that are outside in, in very humane conditions that actually stimulate, stimulate other types of agriculture. It stimulates the, the soils and it, and, and it develops uh, and it, res it helps uh, avoid desertification. And if it's done right in that combination of not just chickens and pigs, and uh, cattle um, can be a very positive effect. Um, but how can we do it with the true costs and total environmental costs and, 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 and those things? So don't please don't anyone get me wrong. Uh, I don't wanna be you know, an extreme vegan and be, that, that's absolutely not the project. It's just these, these long-term effects that sometimes we don't see um, in, in the immediate uh, moment. And, and so uh, I was hoping maybe if, if you've had to deal with those cultures and, and, and what your thoughts or pushbacks are or, or what you've experienced, because you are from there and you've experienced that. I have family in New Zealand, in, in Auckland, New Zealand, and um, um, Julie Bus Buso, um, who's a, a, a famous chef and cookbook, and she owns a hosts a food show as well. And um, so it, it is a it is a big topic in, in general in the region. And so I just wanted to know what the awareness and the transition, and then also with the the Aborigine uh, culture as well. There's a huge issue with the way diets have shifted and changed over over the years, which is uh, creating all sorts of other social and health and uh, uh, economic problems in general. So, I just wanted to get an insight from on the ground and what you're seeing and how how that is progressing and improving, or if it still has a lot of work to do. Yeah, look, I I think it's really important that we that we eat culturally appropriate diets and so um, I guess in Australia what is a culturally appropriate diet but 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 that there is no one diet you know I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not an advocate for you know there's one this one kind of planetary diet because one of the things you know we, we talk about physical health but but there's also the, the, the cultural aspects of food and so if you're if you're Mexican, yes, eat a, a, a Mexican, you know, traditional diet. Or, you know, if you're Indian, eat a traditional Indian diet, or, you know, Italian diet, that sort of thing. If we ate culturally appropriate diets, I think that will go a long way. And one of the things that we need to look at too is to slow down the adoption of the Western style of eating by countries like China. You know, we're seeing that westernization of their diet and try and that's one way that we can, uh, you know, help help to address some of the dietary problems that we have um i, I also i'm not a, you know one of the things that we saw early on and i think and, I, and I, i'm starting to see this change is that we we would be given that message about we'll eat less meat and that's the you know less meat less dairy that's the best thing you can do for for the planet from a dietary perspective and we saw a lot of highly processed meat alternatives come in. And we know that, uh, so, so there's the eating less meat, but, but is, is replacing meat with a highly processed alternative really the answer? And not really, because there's research to show that ultra, elite, ultra high processed foods are you know, bad for your health as well. And some of these products fit into that. So... Now we're starting to see meat alternatives that are more, you know, maybe made from more whole foods and they have a more whole food ingredient list, which, which is better because we're going to get the benefits of the whole food, like, you know, shiitake mushrooms we're seeing being used as meat alternatives and so on. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, there's beans and there's nuts and seeds and things that we can eat as alternatives, which will do the job as well. So... Um, I we we definitely to answer your question like on the ground we definitely one of the biggest changes is that we are seeing people eat less meat so you can go anywhere now and get a vegan option on the menu 
uh, from fast food chains to restaurants to anywhere, just like we, we saw maybe gluten-free take off a few years ago. <laughs> so so that, that's one of the biggest, I guess, trends um, that we're seeing. Uh, so there is that there is that change on the ground. Um, and, and I think the other important point though around this too is that we speak a lot about meat and dairy and we often forget about just that we eat so much junk food. You know, in Australia, 40% 40 or 35% for adults and 40% for kids of our calories come from junk foods. So it's not, I think it's really important not to forget just that we need to eat better quality diets. And if we just, if we reduce our intake of junk food and ate better quality foods, then we'd have better health and we'd have a better environment. And if we, and, and reducing our intake of those kind of highly processed junk foods has almost as much impact as eating less meat. So I think we've got to keep that on the on the agenda as well, you know, in as part of the, the discussion and the conversation. In, in your book, you you also talk about some solutions and, and moving forward, uh, kind of nourishing the future and some tools and, and tips and tricks that people can use to have compelling communication to uh, uh, connect cultures, to be compassionate leaders, to understand this. So a lot of people don't want to get into the discussion, some that, some that we've had today, because they could be controversial or political or cross boundaries or hurt people's feelings, because food is a very cultural and impersonal thing. You know, you're like, I'm hungry, and I don't give a crap what you're saying I want to eat and and don't tell me I can't have this and people don't want to be told what they're doing and and on the flip side they don't want to a lot of people don't want to put innovations in their mouth when they say oh we have this wonderful innovation plant-based meat or whatever else and and I don't want to eat an innovation I want to eat because it's convenient I'm hungry I'm starving and I you know I want to eat that and and so I'd like to kind of maybe the tools or, or the things that you use, if you don't mind giving us some sneak peeks or some things on how you would advise people and what you would tell them and, and how to help them on this journey to make a transition, because it's not something that happens like that. It's something that is a journey and you have to kind of wake up to this understanding on how the ripple effects and how it really impacts us long term. Mm, yes. Yeah, it, it's, it's uh, you know, having um, provided advice to individuals for a couple of decades, um, it is hard to change people's diets. Uh, so there needs to be some internal uh, desire to change. And we know that, uh, you know, food, as you said, it gives us energy. It really provides uh, us with our, you know, life force from within. So food is thinking of food as nourishment and is this food nourishing me I think is a good question to ask yourself when you're eating and and nourish nourishing me doesn't necessarily mean nutrients is it nourishing me just for nutrients it could be that perhaps sometimes you really do feel like I don't know a piece of you know homemade banana cake or something and go well this is really nourishing me because you know it's something I'm I made, you know, I made, I made a banana bread with my son the other day, and it's just like really nourishing because you, you know, you've made it together, and it's it's winter here, and it's you know it's really nice. So, is is the food nourishing me? And 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 going back maybe even to the start, which is like how is how the how around food. So how we eat um, is important too. So not just how food is produced, but uh, you know, sitting down, appreciating, you know, looking at the food and appreciating where it comes from, uh, thinking about everything that's gone into it. You know, if you look at a, a plate of food and you go, wow, you know, that's, that there's a farmer that grew that. There is, it's, you know, it's come to me from, you know, wherever it's come from, it's being cooked or what have you. It, it, having that sort of um gratitude and mindfulness around food helps us to slow down and really enjoy what we're eating and then eating with others too is is 
is, is helpful. So cooking together, eating together, appreciating the food together is, is I think, an, an, a nice way to go about it um, and to help us to slow down and to eat until we've, we feel comfortable. And I like that the, there's a Japanese saying, which is harahachibu, which means 80%, eat until you're 80% full and then stop. And, and that's another strategy too, is just to eat less, you know, for us in where, where we're lucky enough to have a, a plentiful, you know, food supply at the moment, um, that, that we're, that we, you know, we, we tend to, it, it's useful to, to stop when you feel 80% full and not to overeat. Uh, so, and, and, and then of course, not to waste food either. So looking at ways to, you know, if you've got leftovers, keep them, you know, turn them into something else, um, buy what you need, buy what you need, eat what you need, stop when you feel comfortable. Some of those strategies I really like, um, you know, rather than telling people what to eat. Um, and, and so I'm a bit of a fan of the Brazil, there's, there's some dietary guidelines which are based on how to eat, you know, more around behaviours. So Brazil um, is a good example. And, and I, I quite like that idea as a way to give people practical advice that, that sort of, I think, raises, you know, in our culture, we need to raise, raise the value that we place on food or put more value onto food. Um, and, you know, my in-laws are Italian and food is such an important part of the culture which is a bit of a contrast to my upbringing as a, as a uh, I don't know, third generation Australian. It was meat and three veg kind of for dinner um, and, and food wasn't that important in terms of our culture. So, so yeah, appreciating food, being grateful for what we have and, uh, yeah, cooking, eating together, sitting down, I think are all good behaviours to adopt. I love that. And I have five last questions for you. Um, two of them are really probably the, the hardest ones that I have for you. And then the rest are for my listeners. Um, the first one is really, do you feel like you're a global citizen? And how would you feel about a world with the removal of nations, borders, and divisions of humanity, one from another, with keeping in mind that COVID was a global citizen, food is a global citizen, air, water, and species are a global citizen. How would you feel about a world like that? And do you think there's any benefits of that uh, or if it, how our world would look differently? Hmm. So do I see myself as a global citizen? Yeah, I, I think that we're all interconnected and that we are ultimately all on one earth and so if we, we we are all the same we are all part of the human race no no matter where we live what country we're from and so yes i i i would say i'm a global citizen from that perspective in terms of seeing us all as one and that there's so much opportunity to create a better world if we all embrace that common sense of humanity. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? A world that works for everyone would look like helping each other, using each other, um, drawing on each other's strengths and complementing each other uh, to be able to work together and collaborate to create, I guess, or work on pro projects that create a better world like together, yeah. So um, I'm going to actually throw in one more question that's similar to what does a world that works for everyone look like or to you, um, but it's the burning question, WTF, and uh, it's not the swear word that everybody thinks. It's actually what's 
the future or what's the futures? And I want to know for your perspective, not from governments or community or cultures. I want to know for you, what's the plan? What plan are you working towards and, and what's the future? Well, I, I like the, um, you know, the, the future for me would look like reversing some of the impacts that we have created from a climate perspective and be able to regenerate nature, um, you know, land, water, air quality. So to be able to innovate in a way that creates that reversal of some of the impacts that we've had. Uh, and therefore to be able and to be able to then have learned from the past to be able to sustain that world. Uh, so yes, yeah, a little bit of um, yeah, reversal and then maintenance from a from a wisdom perspective and an informed perspective. Yes. Mm. If there was one message that you could depart to our listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? And it's okay if it's a couple messages. Uh, you make a difference and that taking the perspective that in a lifetime, an average person may say know a thousand people who know another thousand people you're one person away from a million people. So knowing that you make a difference with what you say and what you do would be my, my message that yes, you make a difference. And so thinking about what you do, taking responsibility because, because you know you make a difference um, would be my message. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Uh, I think um, now, like what I was talking about before about how we eat, uh, I would adopt that much more early on. I've gone through the phase, when I first started working, we were talking all about low fat eating and high fiber eating and that sort of thing. And, so much about nutrients in food I would drop all of that and just talk about how to eat and uh, be an advocate for uh, appreciating food and, and creating food a food culture that appreciates and elevates the value of food and and I would talk about the social cultural environmental aspects of food much more earlier on in my journey and not just the physical aspects so that's been an evolution for me uh, as a dietitian we trained in nutrients and the physical aspects of food more so than the social cultural environmental aspects but you know we've talked about how everything's interconnected and that's all interconnected and that's what makes food such a powerful lever for change because we're not just addressing the physical and environmental aspects, but we can bring people together and create collaboration and, and those conversations over food around a table. Um, and, and I think we can create change uh, faster if we eat together <laughs> and we come up with our ideas over around a table. <laughs> Absolutely love that. Um, the United Nations has come together. Well, actually, in 2020, the Secretary General uh, said that we will have a UN Food System Summit, and they provided a seat at the table for anyone interested to talk about the complexities of our food system. And the pre-summit will be in July in Rome at the Food and Agriculture Organization, a UN organization in Rome for uh, uh, the pre-summit for the Food System Summit. And then in New York in September. And leading up to that, matter of fact, today I have a, a, a UN Food Systems Dialogue meeting around uh, the meat sector and the controversies in the meat sector and how it's emerging and how there's alternate proteins and many other things but I've been involved in several of those. Um, it's a great opportunity for people to voice their concerns and have a seat at the table, but also to get in and to understand the complexities of our food system and how it needs to be reformed uh, on a finite planet so that we can have 
great energy sources in the future and one that's uh, uh, equal for all. Have you been involved in any of that? Or are you going to be involved in some of that? And how, how do you feel about that opportunity? Yes, I was actually at a, um, a food system dialogue uh, event the other week for the dairy industry here in Australia. Uh, so they've put together some thoughts. And yes, one of my, I guess, having been at that and, um, you know, it, it's a great opportunity to have a, a voice at a global at a global level, but we do need to provide the conditions for people to have their say. I think bringing people together is one thing, but providing them actually with the opportunity to speak up and to voice uh, what's on their mind and to contribute their ideas is another thing. And so, you know, we actually, um, you know, when you, we get together, often I think conversation can be dominated by a couple of people and you might have, I don't know, eight or ten people around a table, but you might only have two or three of them talking. And so I'm, I'm sort of evolving now. My next thing is, well, how do we create the, or give people the internal resources to speak up? Uh, because we know that half the people, even though the environment may feel safe, you know, half the people aren't going to speak up anyway. And so we, I think we have a lot of ideas that are trapped in people's minds that, you know, uh, if we have the right conditions and provide them with the internal, uh, you know, resources or personal power to speak up, that that's going to be helpful. So, yes, bring people to the table, but give them the space to speak. I love that. And uh, the dialogues are open for curators all over the world. If you want to curate a dialogue yourself with us, whatever topics, there's five action tracks. And then we have food heroes and food champions and, and many other things uh, going on there. So please feel free to be involved. Really, uh, Sharon, that's all I have for you. We've answered all the questions. It's been a fabulous uh, time. And unless there's something that you didn't get to say, then now is your chance to, to let us know uh, what we missed. Or if, the, if I didn't let you get a word in edgewise to kind of tell <laughs> us what you really wanted to say during our conversation. No, that's all great. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And it was really nice to meet you too. Sharon, thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. It's good to, to finally uh, see you and, and uh, um, we'll, we'll find a time in the future to see each other personally again and, and or for the first time and, and uh, give you some copies of the book, Menu B. Uh, thanks so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. I have a good day. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.